Praise the Lord, and welcome all of you on Facebook and YouTube to our service here at the Corner Church this morning. Scriptures this morning, I'm going to begin in the Gospel of, well, I'm going to begin in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke verses, wait, I don't know if that's the one I want. Yeah, chapter 14, verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Before we go to the scriptures, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we glorify you and praise you this morning, Father. Father, we thank you, Father, for the blessing of just being able to assemble ourselves together to worship you and to give you glory and praise and thanksgiving. And the fact that your word even tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So Father God, as we have assembled here this morning, Father, to glorify you, to praise you, Father, but Father, also to be fed by your word, your word of life, your word of truth, your word of healing, your word of eternal life. Father, it is your word, Father, that fulfills every need that we can possibly ever have, and not just for this world, but for eternity. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father, your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, who loved us so much that he was willing to go to the cross and lay down his life and shed his blood for the remission and forgiveness of our sins and take victory over death itself. And in the resurrection, Father, we don't even have death to fear because Jesus took victory over death. And that today we can live in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Father God, I pray as we come to your word that by your indwelling Holy Spirit, you would quicken your word, manifest your word to be the fulfillment of every need. And Father, I yield and humble myself to lead into your Holy Spirit that it might be your words and not mine through thy Holy Son, Jesus' name, Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Luke, chapter 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come after me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether we have sufficient to finish it? lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going forth to make war against another king setteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth ambassadors and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. For he that he hath ears to hear, let him hear. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I believe I'm going to go on to the Gospel of John in a minute, but I want to... Praise the Lord, God's word could come strictly from this passage. And 
no need of going further, but I just want to cover a few points in this scripture. It's a point that so often is misinterpreted and misunderstood in the world and what God's word truly says. I heard a person, we was in a conversation and praise the Lord, she understood and knew what the word really said. But she was talking about ourselves. And so often the world thinks that for a Christian, we are to think less of ourselves. As my wife Vivian said the other day, if I don't love myself, how in the world can I love anybody else? And the scripture about hate what this word really means is to love less than God. We love God more than ourselves. See, we set things in order because God is number one in our life. We don't hate our mother and we don't hate our father. We don't hate our sister. We don't hate our children. We love them. And that's what God desires. To. But see, we cannot love them the way God wants us to love him, love them. If God is not number one in our life, God is on the throne. And our first, first focus of everything and the aspects of life is to love God first. And as God then loves us, he shows us how to love our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, those around us. And even when you get there to about to forsake all that he has, you know, it doesn't mean that you just automatically just get rid of everything and I go become a pauper out in the streets. No, it doesn't mean that. It means to set things in order of priorities. Just like how we so often have things misconstrued about the physical aspects of life and our possessions. Sometimes, whether it's a friend or a relative, mother, father, sister, brother, husband, what? Sometimes the thought is, well, I can't get rid of anything because they're my memories of so-and-so. We do have keepsakes. Sure, we have keepsakes. But our memories are in our heart. Our memories are in our heart. It's not in a spoon or a hammer or anything like that. That's not where the memory is. That's an object. Love comes from the heart. Love doesn't come from material aspects. Love doesn't come from this box or that or anything. Love comes from the heart. And what God is showing us here, what Jesus is showing us here, is that in all things, we place him number one. And about counting the cost, we have to realize because of the world that we're in, even the world that Jesus was in with these disciples, there was a cost to proclaiming Jesus 
as Lord and Savior, the Messiah. Because when that happened, the world rebuked the disciples. And we see it today. I believe it is really coming down to the greatest rebuke of God that has happened from the time of creation. That's the world we live in today. God is being rebuked. And if we have associated ourselves from an identity standpoint, I'm a Christian. The world is out to destroy. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. So yes, when we proclaim Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior, we need to realize that we need to be fortified each and every day. How do we fortify ourselves? Through God's word, the armor of God, being fed by the word, being fed by our meditations that we have in the word, our reading, our hearing of the word, our hearing of the word, whether it's just a friend to friends sharing passages or scriptures or talking about the scriptures, whether it's by preaching of the word, we are washed by the water of the word. We are strengthened by his word. I mean, I think it was last week when we were talking about, you know, you know, when a place, you know, a devil was cast out and, and then all of a sudden that devil then takes seven others when he realizes that place is clean and swept and garnished. It might have been on one of my lives, I don't know, but that, that passage I had recently. And then uh, when he comes back into that person, he brings seven others. And the latter state of the man is, or person is far worse than the beginning. See, what happens there, it's like here's, someone starts down a road, but they're not willing to stay on that road. Sometimes in the scriptures and there are certain passages that people call the Roman word, the word of the Roman word for salvation, and it's the various verses out of Romans. I like to look at our walk with the Lord after salvation of getting on the highway to heaven and then staying on that road in life. God gives us physical examples of spiritual lessons. And out of those physical examples, when we're always, when we're, when we're trying to bring everything back to God's word, Virtually everything that takes place in the natural, you can take back to God's word and see a spiritual lesson in it. Some of you have heard me talk about one thing that when Vivian and I was blessed to be able to travel the country in a motorhome. There was a work associated with it, but we had a lot of time to see different things. That was the days before these... Uh, Map question, what's this, the, the thing? GPS. Yeah, the GPS. I don't use it. Sometimes I should. But Vivian was my GPS because she would always have the map open, especially when I would do something that was my nature to do it. I would like to find shortcuts, especially when we were not on a Let's say we're on a sightseeing thing and, and I would glance at the map and, and you know, this broad, dark red road goes kind of around here. And I think I can cut through here. But I also just wanted to explore and see. Well, see, in our spiritual life, the highway to heaven you can equate it as that 
dark red wide line on the map. But then there's all these other branches. Sometimes the red line becomes a narrow red line. Then you go to the black lines, and the black lines can be a broad line, and then all of a sudden they can come down to a narrow black line. And then they can come down to a very narrow, thin gray line. Vivian's reminder to me would be when I would get on one of those narrow green, uh, gray lines. I have, I'll never forget her expression. You're going to hit sand. Because when you get down in Florida and Alabama and Georgia, one thing you did not want to do is you did not want to hit sand. Because in the marshes and the tidal areas, the sand was loose sand and sinking sand. A heavy vehicle doesn't do well on that. And sometimes when you hit sand, it used to be a road on through there, but it's no longer a road. There's no way through. You know. Well, see, that's our spiritual life. It's why Jesus is solid rock. You know. My house is built on the solid rock of Jesus. I don't build a house on the sand. I don't want to build my spiritual life with God on that loose sand. Not only is that loose sand, you know, sinking and you can't even get any traction in it or anything. There's even some that is what they call quicksand. And it literally swallows you up. Consumes you. That's a physical explanation of what happens sometimes when someone says, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior last night. But then they stay there, right there. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to worry about anything. We read there about the salt. Salt has lost its favor. What's it done? It's just cast out. Hmm. Because if I'm a disciple, Jesus shows me that I need to be fruitful. I need to be on the king's highway, the highway to heaven. And bring others on to the highway of heaven, allowing God to use me as that vessel for him to work through. There's a lot out there that don't know and understand Jesus is Lord and Savior. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, there's a passage, and in my Bible, what this passage is, the believer's assurance. See, in this world, because I know that the world is a lost and dying world, I want to know that if before I finish this service, I draw my last breath. I want to know that I'm going to be with my Lord and Savior. And I want to, as a result of that, I want to have that peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Peace that Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. I want that peace on my life. And by having that peace on my life, I don't have to be afraid of anything. I can have peace, I can have contentment regardless of what I'm doing, regardless of where I'm at, and regardless of what I'm saying. I do not have anything to worry about. I do not have any fear other than that reverent fear for God. That parental type fear of a child to a parent. Yes, the parent corrects. It might be the type of correction that you don't want. But then later in life, we're able to look back and see the value of that chastisement. 
Scripture says we wouldn't even be God's children if he didn't chasten us. But here in the Scripture, we see both the example of the unbelieving and the believing. John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. I'm not going to pass that winter without stopping and talking about winter. You know, in Ecclesiastes, we read about the time for everything. A time to sow, a time to reap, a time to eat, everything. In the world, we have four seasons, don't we? We like to start out with, you know, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Nobody, not too many people like winter. There's good winter sports that some people enjoy. But the physical aspect of the cold and the chilling and the shivering and all those things. And the, other than when a blanket of snow covers everything, everything is gray and bleak and, see, it's dead. It's dead. See, spring is that time for planting, that time for sowing seeds. Summer is a time for growing. And the fall is a time for harvesting. And what was not of value didn't get harvested and died in the winter freeze. And this starts out, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple on Solomon's porch then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt if thou be Christ? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And see, right there in those few verses, we see that not only was it a physical time of winter, but it was also winter for those that Jesus was talking about. They were dead. They were dead in the winter freeze. This passage then continues. And I give them, praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answering them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works, those works, do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he being then gods, if, if he being, if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemy, because I said, I am the Son of God. 
If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore, that, that they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hands. And he went away at that point. He left them be. See, they had the opportunity. That passage there may be a little confusing about being called gods. There's multiple words that refer to God in the scriptures. If you go back to Psalm 82, verse 6, it talks about being called God. So I want to just read, maybe, maybe I want to read that. Psalm 82. It's helpful when we're reading the words and sometimes something like that pops up and we'd say, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Ye are gods. Psalm 82. God is in control. God standeth in a congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, lowercase. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the land of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princesses. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. That word there, gods, is Elohim. And out of all the names for God, Elohim is about God, but it's also the office of God. And the priests, the Pharisees, sat in the office of God to administer justice and to tell, show God's word and ways and teach and feed the people. And as a result, what he was coming against was the scribes and the Pharisees, which is the same group of people that we're dealing with here in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. Different times, God uses us in different ways. In this world, God's disciples especially the ones that are placed in the position of the pastors, the teachers. It is very important that what the pastor or the teacher is teaching is not what he wants to teach and not what his ideas are, but what God's word says. And there is, it shows us throughout the scripture there is extreme judgment on what comes forth from the pulpit. It's a responsibility because it's sitting in the office of what God has ordained and established. But he calls each and every one to be a disciple. And in that same man, but in a lesser manner, we all have to be careful when we're in casual conversations with someone. When we're talking to someone. When we're trying to encourage someone. The reality of it is, there's a couple phrases in the Bible. You still know that he is God. I'm not God. None of us is God. 
He is on control on the throne. And listen to the still small voice. The still small voice is God's indwelling Holy Spirit quickening, quickening us putting those words on the tongue to encourage somebody, to strengthen somebody, to lift them up, to lead them to the family of God, where they can have peace, where they can have contentment, the peace that God says, my peace I give unto you, not this world give it, give unto you. The peace that we can never explain to another individual. It's God's peace. God's peace. And I'll tell you, the world that we're living in today of all times, if we don't have God's peace, we are in extreme turmoil. It's hard to get through a day. But praise God, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. And in another place, for greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. You know, I have nothing to fear because he hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. What a blessing. Praise God, hallelujah. Father God, we give you glory and praise this morning, Father. And Father, as your word, Father, has come forth we just worship you and praise you and thank you, Father, for all things. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, I just lift each individual up, spirit, soul, and body. Father, we need your indwelling Holy Spirit, your comforter. Father, because without your indwelling Holy Spirit, we don't have you. We don't have you. But Father, with you, by having you, as the scripture says, our Christ is all in all, fulfilling every need that we can possibly have. But then bringing us peace, bringing us contentment, that we can truly rejoice with joy and be able to shout from the house of praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Lord Jesus. Father God, we do give you glory. We give you praise and thanksgiving. And I pray for that quickening by your indwelling Holy Spirit this morning, Father. And Father, we worship you as I ask your blessings upon each. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Our closing hymn is uh, 213. 213, I know in whom I have believed. 213.
The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace through thy holy son, Jesus' name. God bless. Go in peace. Amen.